Welcome to our epic ocean, where critical solutions to a planet in peril are brought to the surface. Our epic ocean celebrates all that is epic about the ocean and why it is the planet's most vital resource. And now to our host, Rich German. 20 years ago, Ryan Black and some friends went on an adventure to Brazil to celebrate Y2K. While they were there, they discovered a magical and nutritious berry that had healing powers, and they were compelled to bring it to the U.S. They created a business selling the acai berry and subsequently joined a movement of mission-driven companies addressing the planet's biggest issues through an alternative economic model. Today, we have Ryan's brother, Jeremy Black, co-founder of Samazon, and Richard Yellen, a filmmaker, who has just released his latest effort, Seeding Change, which tells this important story. Jeremy and Richard, welcome to the show. How are you guys doing? Doing great. We're doing good. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Glad to have you here. So, Jeremy, take us back to the beginning. How did your brother's trip to Brazil lead to a global movement based on the acai berry? Well, they were there um, in Brazil. They were surfing. They were learning about the culture, and they found themselves on this beautiful little island about two hours, a two-hour flight off the coast of Brazil, and they were diving, they were surfing, and uh, they were eating acai bowls every day, which were introduced to them by some of the locals, and by the time it was time to go home, they were like, how are we going to go home without acai? Um, and they thought, we're in the middle of the Atlantic, we've got acai, we can figure out how to get this back to the U.S., I'm sure, and they started their journey of trying to figure out how to put a, bl a business plan together. And, uh, you know, 20 years later, here we are. So 20 years later, here we are. And you have created a new movie called Seeding Change that was just released. Congratulations on that. I just watched it and I absolutely loved it. It's a very powerful film. Richard, how did the movie come about and why was it important for you as a filmmaker to take on this project? Yes, well, I am a, a filmmaker who's super concerned with the environment, uh, with the ocean, uh, with the ecosystems, uh, with social issues. Um, and I, along the way, I've covered such topics in my films like people with spinal cord injuries going surfing uh, and floating the Nathan Gokey story um, and how that really changed the, the paradigm on how people look at people in wheelchairs as people with unique abilities. It was part of a movement. I mean, people, uh, the whole movement of challenge athletes really was, was launched with that work we did called they will surf again, which enabled those, we, we got volunteers together and enabled those with spinal cord injuries to go surfing. I think the power of filmmaking is that we can transmit these messages and powerful stories, open people's minds, change people's perceptions. Um, you know, I've done a lot of work on the plastic issue, plastic pollution, short films on on uh, the five gyres work um, and short films with sustainable surf and working on, uh, you know, ocean healing with my film Between Two Harbors, uh, people with cancer getting to go on an ocean adventure to, to experience ocean healing, which now there's science to back it. So, uh, the the challenge is, is that as a filmmaker, how do we tackle the biggest issues that we face today um, in one story? And I think we, we found it here with Seeing Change. And it started really with Samazon's story with one company's mission in the Amazon 20 years ago to – really change the way people think about doing business and really like how can we not only harvest berries sustainably but possibly even protect rainforests and take care of the people there and they have this idea that i think to put value in the trees there in the amazon which in a sense would protect them from being cut down so it's really started with a credit to samazon for really wanting to to start their story because really we happen into the bigger story through the process of telling samazon's story um and along the way of uh, talking about Samazon starting 20 years ago in the Amazon, learning how to, to, to become a fair trade company, how to do this organically. Um, 
how to, how to build schools in the Amazon, build hospitals to take care of the people down there. I mean, it's a really powerful story. It's really moving. And when I went to the Amazon to film, I was so blown away. It was so powerful because you've seen a, a third world country in these regions where they're harvesting us. I turn into more second world type of economies. Um, it's so powerful. And Along the way of trying to tell us Amazon story, we we learned about other companies that they worked with, like Dr. Bronner's and Guayaki and Numi T that were part of a collective of companies. So as we went to really tell us Amazon story, we were looking at some of the partners, the early partners that they worked with to get insight on Amazon story. And and uh, as we got deeper into it, and Jeremy can speak to this as well, you know, the the founders of Savazon were like, hey, this is actually bigger than us. And we as, you know, myself as a documentary filmmaker wanting to really dig for the deeper, bigger story. I was like, yes, like, let's let's talk about the bigger mission here. You know, we've got we're over the last few years, climate crisis have been intensifying, you know, the wildfires that Jer Jeremy lost his home. I was evacuated from my home, uh, the hurricanes in the East Coast, you know, um, the fires in Brazil, I mean, you know, working on some of these other initiatives, like I said, I with scientists at Sustainable Surf, I'm really intimate with these issues, you know, and with the pandemic we're going through as well and global health, you know, and the way that we look at the global population is how we're going to handle uh, these solutions as a collective that isn't just a nationalistic approach within our country. So long story short, what we re we happen upon here in the movie and the, in, starting with Amazon was really this collective movement within companies that 20 years ago started together um, because they couldn't do it alone. They wanted to solve issues like plastic packaging. They wanted to um, take care of the workers better. They wanted an organic product. They wanted to, um, you know, through their work, actually, instead of cutting rainforests down, they wanted to actually start regenerating um, so that all these ideas came to the forefront instead of, uh, instead of, creating products that put plastic in the ocean. Let's like make products you know, that are made from upcycled plastic. So we were able to look at a collective of companies across these different industries and tell a story. And in so doing, uh, educate consumers how they too can be part of the solution by voting with their dollars and supporting companies that are actually part of the solution. Beautiful. So you brought up a lot there and we're going to break it all down. Uh, Jeremy, for you, like, it sounds like you made this movie to really celebrate 20 years in business and to share some of the challenges and lessons that you learned. And it sure seems like the project evolved into something much bigger than maybe you originally imagined. Am I correct? And if so, how so? Yeah, I mean, originally it was it was going to be a story about what Sambazon is doing. And as we looked at it, we wanted to talk more about the movement. Um, we wanted to bring stories of other companies that were doing something similar. Um, more or less making the trees too valuable to cut down um, and, and other solving other issues that we were facing um, climate crisis, um, plastic in the ocean. And, um, and then we wanted to leave the viewers with something that, you know, would inspire them and give them solutions instead of a lot of the environmental docs, unfortunately, which are kind of gloom and doom and kind of a bummer. Um, which is like, you are the solution. Like you can start making, you know, change today that will have a domino effect in the global, you know, issues that we're having by learning how to vote with your dollar. So, um, that's, that's kind of what it turned into. It's a message that we, we always talked about, but we figured if we're going to, if we're going to make a movie, let's make sure we share these concepts because it's, conversations around this that is is what's needed you know i'm really glad that you brought that up i remember years ago watching inconvenient truth and i remember like i don't know halfway through the movie i was like okay al i got it we're in trouble tell me what to do tell me what to do tell me what to do and it never really happened it was like as the credits were rolling it was like okay change your light bulbs and i was left with this kind of gloom and doom feeling like you were talking about um, before the flood, Leo, Leo DiCaprio's movie, I kind of felt the same way. And they're important movies to really create awareness, but like, it was like, give me something to do. So I think this movie really does that. And we'll talk about that for sure. So 
You guys feature so many epic people in this film. There's superstars like Kelly Slater, Rob Machado, Paul Hawken, who's incredible. Uh, my friend Evan Marks of the Ecology Center here in Southern California. And then, like you mentioned, Richard, so many people doing great work from different companies like Dr. Bronner's, Numi T, Guayaki. I would imagine that a challenge in creating a, a doc like this is connecting everybody's stories and really finding a common thread. And while showcasing each person and each company's personality, you did a really good job of this in this movie. So I'm, I'm just curious, how did you find this common thread? Thank you. Good question. I think that was at the heart of our challenge at, with this film is covering so much terrain, as you saw with my first answer, concisely. <laughs> and I think how do we connect these dots between these different companies that all have amazing missions? And I think it was boiling it down to a few questions. Uh, what does social entrepreneurship mean? Um, you know, what what is your mission and how are you tackling it as you, with your group, with your company? Um, you know, what does vote with your dollar mean for you? Um, and really uh, focusing on that. Other questions that we asked them was like, well, what about global warming or climate crisis? Is it a real problem? Uh, what do you what do you say to naysayers? I mean, I, honestly, making this movie a big concern for me was all the people that are really trying to shoot science down, you know? So there were a lot of issues, um, but I think there were like definitely with each group and each interviewee, we could really focus on a few key questions. But I think at the end of the day, the real connective tissue was those companies that started on this mission, like Amazon over 20 years ago, they, they did it together. So while it's now a movement with a bunch of companies and you know a new generation of social entrepreneurs and and now uh, consumers demanding transparency and climate crisis getting to the point where we all are starting to recognize the need to do something now. At the end of the day, though, for this film to work, uh, we needed to, 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 to uncover that real story when. Guayaki and and uh, Amazon were in the trade booth together twenty years ago, trying to figure this out because there were no models on how to how to create a supply chain out of the rainforest, how to regenerate, how to do all these things. So they had to help each other. You know, Guayaki mentored Amazon. Amazon inspired Dr. Bronner's to to become more regenerative in their farming. So really starting to mine these kind of storylines that connected them from the early days. And then as we spread out to companies, say like Outer Known, uh, which is really doing a good job in, in, in the clothing industry and fashion, um, mm -hmm. as we move outward from there, um, some of these, these points just further il illustrate what our initial core story is um, across a different industry and uh, a different problem, i.e. the plastic problem in the ocean. That one of the things that, that Arno does by upcycling, um, upcycling plastic to create fabrics, et cetera. So. Exactly. So I want to come back to this whole concept of collaboration and how these companies are, are working together, That, which is a definite paradigm shift. But you've brought up a couple of times – this concept of voting with your dollars. I want to hear from both of you. Uh, Jeremy, to you, what does what does it mean? What does this look like? And what is the potential impact of voting with your dollars? Yeah, I mean, voting with your dollars is being conscious that every dollar you spend is going to have an impact. You're going to basically ask the company that made that product to make more of that for you because you want more. You're giving them an affirmation of like, thank you for making this product. I'm going to buy it again from you. Put it back on the shelf. So, you know, you really have to think deep and wide around where you spend your money and think about, you know, what am I doing for food? What am I doing for clothing? What am I doing for energy? Where am I investing my dollars? Even if it's in your retirement fund, what even, even an investment in a S and P 500 stock fund means that you're, investing in those 500 top s p companies whether you really believe in what they're doing or not um people are just starting to realize that um your banking you know yeah, your bank i was gonna say your bank your bank's sure. a huge one is your bank supporting you know fossil fuel you know enterprises that are doing the opposite of what you're lining up in the protest in the streets for you know so there's a, there's an element of you know 
us as the consumers coming to realize that like we actually have the power here and we need to start making change in what we do it starts with you and and then share it with your friends and family and if we all start to say hey we don't want that we want electric cars we don't want gas cars look what's going to happen the whole industry is going to change and as and you're seeing that happen with cars happen. right now you're seeing that happen with electricity you're even seeing banks now they're saying we will not invest in fossil fuel um the companies in this film are a lot of examples of companies that said, hey, we're not going to we're not going to work with non-organic products. You know, we're going to make sure our products are organic. We're going to try and be fair trade in every way that we can. And so we're going to offer those products to you. So now as the consumer, it's your option to choose. Do you want to buy from companies that act like that or companies that maybe are a little bit cheaper because they don't care if they're paying fair trade prices on their let's call it bananas or something that's in their their product. Mm -hmm. So. That's a, it's, it's a an incredibly it. simple. Yeah, it's a very simple concept, and it's very powerful once you start acting on it. You know, a beach cleanup. You could go pick up a piece of trash and feel empowered, but also feel overwhelmed that you're not going to be able to make a difference. Um, and I think that with the doom and gloom films, uh, there is that. I think there's a negative reinforcement that the problem is too big. But when you start acting on voting with your dollar, there's a power to it. Um, that you're actually, instead of buying that shirt that goes to the landfill, you're buying that shirt that actually pulls, that upcycles, that pulls stuff out of the landfill. You, you can feel the power in that. And you also can start thinking, if I go to the market and I buy a drink that, that cuts down the rainforest, I'm going to be actually sending them a message. Like, I actually believe in that. But what you find is through this process that the consumer doesn't want that more and more the consumer wants to align their values with the right thing with good values they don't want to be responsible for 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 polluting or for cutting rainforest and they don't want to be part of this problem they want to be part of the solution i think there's um you know uh when i got an electric car i uh, just because of the bottom line of it, I, I, I looked into solar panels because my, my, my electric bill went way up. And so, you know, if I got solar panels now and all of a sudden I'm going, hey, isn't that cool? I'm I'm farming with the sun. I'm powering my car. I'm selling extra back to the the electric company. So it's a very cool thing and it can be very individualistic. I think that, you know, it can be in a way like for lack of a better word, it can be a very selfish kind of action. I think we as humans need to be, we need to take care of ourselves first before we can take care of others. So I think that the heart of this solution is the answer. Cause I know that the politicians, while they might be well-intended and we should vote for the ones that back the policies that, will support our environmental missions uh, and our social missions. At the end of the day, I hold the power in my wallet. And the minute that we share that concept and the minute we can turn someone onto it, the minute they're going to feel that power and they're going to be part of the solution. And we hope, just like we are, completely get, getting a thrill out of taking action with our spending. Uh, we hope other people to get that, to get that thrill as well and, and start, start making change. Cause I think that, that we do, we have billions and billions and billions of dollars of spending power in our pocket every day. We're making transactions, right? hundred percent. I, I, I love that this came up and you said the word selfish. I, I call it good selfishness. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like people, um, they get overwhelmed. The problems are too big. You know, what if I pick up some plastic from the beach, I'm not making a difference. And so mm -hmm. we just feel like we're adding to the problem. And what you're offering here is a way to be a, a real concrete part of the solution. And that's really why I love everything that you guys are up to. Jeremy, I'm, I'm curious, take us back when you founded Samazon. What were the core values of the company when you created it? And how has that evolved over the years? Yeah, so when we started, um, you know, we were really concerned about making sure that if Samazon was successful and we could share acai with, you know, the world, that our activities would have a beneficial impact on the ecosystem of the Amazon and the people that live there. So, you know, organic and fair trade were two of the biggest principles that we knew that were really important to, to put in our, you know, in our mission to instill within our values so that 
regardless of how the company grew, um, the people that would be working in the company would understand that those are principles and we need to continue to uphold those. We market those and we share those with our sales team and with our buyers even so that, you know, one day, because companies do sell, um, you couldn't just go in there and say, oh, now you're not going to do organic or fair trade. They, that would rip the soul and heart out of the company. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure that the heart and soul of the company had those elements so that, in essence, they were protected. Um, mm -hmm. And luckily for us, we've, we've been able to do that. Not only that, but we've actually been able to have a major impact on the whole acai industry because it was so young when we started um, by having almost a standard of organic and fair trade for our products. It's helped almost make the other competitors have those same standards in order, in order to compete. And that's the, the beauty of us being able to get in on something that was kind of in its infancy is we could help set a standard that others would have to follow. So now almost all of the acai that's sold is, is organic and fair trade, which is, you know, which is amazing because that was our yeah. biggest fear um, was, was to, for it to go the other way. Definitely. It is amazing. It seems like you were an early adopter with these principles. Where did these ideals come from? Was there some of that inspired you? Yeah. I mean, between myself and my brother and Skanda, our other founder, you know, both my brother and Skanda went to Colorado Boulder. They had a lot of good hippie influence there. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I think just, just the desire to do things right, you know, um, was kind of instilled within us and, um, be respectful of the environment. I mean, being a surfer, you know, wanting to make sure that we take care of the environment and, um, you know, your, your earlier question, part of the question was how has it evolved? I mean, it's, it's kind of stayed the same except, you know, it's, it's evolved to be more complicated. You know, now we're looking at our carbon footprint. Now we're looking at our packaging things that we never really dreamed of in the beginning that were going to be stuff that we could tackle. You know, once you start down the path of, of sustainability, it's a journey. Um, mm. You're not going to find an end. You're going to be able to keep looking. You got to keep getting better. Um, so, and that's kind of like what's voting with your dollars as well. It's like, we just want to open a conversation with you about voting with your dollars. It's going to be a lifetime of learning. And we want to start a conversation when you start looking at it you're going to start to understand it and then you're going to go deeper and deeper. And over time, you know, it's, it's going to be really rewarding when you start to understand where, who you're supporting, what kind of companies you're investing in buying from, you know, definitely. I, I, that's what I love about the movie. It, it really opened up my eyes in a lot of ways, which we'll get into here. And one of them actually was how you talk about a triple bottom line, right? So you want to obviously make a profit for your company. You also want to do good for your people and you want to do good for the planet at the same time. This sounds wonderful, but my question is how realistic is this knowing that historically, at least most big companies were pretty much just focused on the profit with little regard for the impact that they were making on the planet. Richard, how would you answer that one? Well, I would say that, that it starts with caring and, and, and having that desire first. So I think that like, a triple bottom line business where you are concerned not only with the economic performance, but you also want to keep an eye on financial and social impacts. I mean, obviously there's financial impact bottom line, which is always going to be part of your business. But when you're thinking about the environment or you're thinking about social issues and how you take care of the people that are doing the work, those, when you start thinking about those things, I think that's when, uh, when things start happening, you know, I think, Again, Amazon, they didn't know how they were going to do that right off the bat, and they had to figure out how to, to make it work. Um, I think there's you know, a definition that's very loose for a triple bottom line company, but I would say that overall that once you set out and say, hey, we're going to be a company that cares not only about our bottom line, but also about the social and environmental impacts, and then in fact, those are just as important, then that sets off. Uh, a process. And I think every company in this movie has gone through that. Once they start that, they're like, and I think Mark, uh, the CEO of, of Outer Known does a really good job of walking through every step. Once he started taking that approach, like, okay, we have to do this. And now all of a sudden it opens up this Pandora's box of all these other problems that they have to solve now that they've committed to that. So yeah. I think uh, in the interest of trying to concisely, um, 
answer the question. I think that on one hand, you can't really measure a triple bottom line. But on the other hand, once you say you're committed and you are actually following a triple bottom line, then you that to follow through, you have to start going through these steps and, and, and we'll start making a difference. Yeah, Mark was great. And I, I remember the exact scene you were talking about in the movie. He really, he laid it out. It's like, yeah, you know, this problem. And then there's this one and there's this one. And it just kind of keeps going. So exactly. would, I guess my question next would be, would it be easy for companies to shift their model, even a small company like a, a, a pizza place, let's say, can little turns of the dial make a real impact? Yeah, I mean, I would say that, of course, they can. And sometimes if you try and shift it all at once, you know, the whole house of cards can come down, you know. Mm. It's one thing to start a company with these values and build the model. And that's kind of what we did and some of these other companies did. But I've watched some other companies like Cliff Bar is a great example who were not you know, using organic and they basically said, okay, we want to get there. It's going to take us five years or 10 years. I forgot the exact time. And then we're going to get to 70% and then we're going to get to this. Sometimes it's impossible. So, you know, it really starts with saying, we're going to do this. We're going to start measuring this and then putting together your initiatives. Once you start down the path, you can, you can start to make progress, you know, but if you just say, ah, it's impossible. We're not going to do it. You're never going to get anywhere. So, you know, you got to start. There's a good, there's a good example real quick. I think of, 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 of our production actually doing this, um, with regards to offsetting our footprint, um, of our, of our travel on the film, we didn't necessarily set out like, Hey, we're going to be a green production necessarily. We had that in the back of our mind, but once we got into this idea of like, hey, how can we make our production more sustainable? How can we perhaps offset the carbon footprint of our film production? Um, working with Sea Trees Foundation, we ended up planting mangrove trees to offset the carbon on all of our travel to Brazil, to Detroit, to all over California, the boats on the Amazon, and that through the scientists at Sustainable Surf, we were able to understand that the biggest impact we could have if we wanted a green production was simply to offset our travel. So that's a really good example of just taking one step was a big step was how can we offset the travel on our film? And all of a sudden now we are a production that is committed to down this path of becoming not only concerned with our bottom line, but also our impact socially and environmentally. Yeah. So it sounds like it's a, if I'm understanding this correctly, it's a combination of what can a company do in your case, a movie to, um, lessen your carbon footprint and everything that you do. And then the movie is a great example. At the end of it, how do you offset what da quote unquote damage was done? Is that, am I, is that a fair way to put it? That's right. Yeah. Actually, I'd love, yeah. I was going to say, I was, I was going to share that uh, a spoiler alert. And that was that I love the very last scene of the movie, which is where you share that carbon footprint that you made and what you did to offset it. And to me, that was just a great example, Richard, of really walking the walk. Um, I actually interviewed Michael Stewart recently of Sustainable Surf and Sea Trees. I'm huge, oh, fans, I'm huge fans of their work, and yeah, they're, he's amazing guy. So I'm glad I'm I'm glad you brought that up before I did. So I want to back up a, a little, Jeremy, to what you said about um, baby steps, and I, I'll kind of be devil's advocate if I can for a moment. So obviously, with this film, you want to raise awareness, you want to educate people, and these are vital, right? Um, that being said, we live in a place in history where we no longer have the luxury of time, right? We need to see real change if we want to protect both the planet and ourselves as a human species. So we're at this all hands on deck moment. So I guess my question is, are baby steps enough? Um, and how do you feel we can, that this film and this movement can really shift social entrepreneurship and consumer choices to lead to the real impact that we, not that we want, but we need at the, you know, where we find ourselves in the world today. Yeah, well, definitely baby steps aren't going to do it. Um, that's for sure. We need a, a combination of public and, um, you know, government and policy and everything to come together. Um, and, and, you know, we do not, we do not respond to threats as well, unless they're right in our face. And that's like, philosophy and that's you know human 
behavior. Um, Paul actually talks about it in the movie, how it's like if we're not as a, a species able to deal with these threats that aren't immediate, you know, because you've got threats that are in front of you. You know, That's right. the reality, though, is we have to start making steps, whether they're baby steps or bigger steps. And the idea of for us, at least bringing up this conversation of vote with your dollars, start to figure this out, because those shifts can change things very, very quickly, especially, you know, it, it, it when it comes down to it, everything follows the money. Everything follows the big money. And if all of a sudden all the banks start to say, we're not going to invest in fossil fuels. We're not going to invest in this. Those industries are going to be running scared, changing the way they do what they do, you know. And and the idea of inspiring entrepreneurs to create businesses that solve problems. I mean, we have a golden age upon us of opportunity for op, uh, entrepreneurs that want to solve climate change problems, you know whether it's some crazy technology that pulls CO2 from the air, which is happening, or, you know, you name it out there. There's so many cool things being thought about right now that aren't like kids aren't sitting around like they were thinking, how am I going to make the most money um, coming up with some cool idea? They're actually starting to think about how am I going to solve a major problem? In the end, they still might make a lot of money doing it, but like, change the paradigm of like, mm. what can I do? How can I solve this problem is, is becoming, you know, I think a lot more apparent these days. It definitely is. And it's still a triple bottom line thing. Cause like you said, they're going to solve a problem that's good for people and for the planet. And by solving these problems they are going to become extremely wealthy as we're seeing in, in many cases. So Richard, the, the challenge that I see over the years with most documentaries is so, and obviously you've experienced this too, so much time and effort is made into creating a beautiful film mm -hmm. and then not enough eyeballs ever see it. And therefore mm -hmm. the message and the meaning has little impact. So what's the plan to get people not only to hear the critical message in the movie, mm -hmm. but also act upon it? In other words, how, how do we keep this conversation going? This is a really good question. I think it's a really important question to ask um, at the beginning of every film project. Like, what what is the end goal and how are we going to engage people? And I think the number one job for me as a documentarian is the story first. And so you really got to focus on the story and make the best film possible. And um, and and I think that the the big challenge with with films like this that really have a mission at the center is 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 trying to differentiate between the story and the mission. So my job every day is coming to the film shoot, like where's the story um, and really being on guard for that. Because at, at the end of the day, you know, if the, if the movie is really just about the mission, it's no longer a movie anymore. So it's, it's, it's just a, it's a mission statement. So um, for one, we hope to tell the best possible story and, and execute it the best it can be to get it, the story really successfully communicating on all cylinders. And then I think then the other part is how do we then distribute it and what kind of strategies for distribution? So I don't need to go too deep on that, but in this case we had a successful film festival run. We won a number of awards, um, a grand jury prize at the awareness film festival, a few awards at the impact docs, a sustainable business award at cinema Verde. We were at dozens of film festivals, you know, not only here, but, uh, abroad. Uh, so I think that, uh, Task one is like, do we have in, to, uh, something that we can engage people with? You never know until you deliver it, a film, where the audience is. And I think this is a really interesting question simply because I think this film started more as like an educational effort. Like it's going to just be more of a, uh, a business school type film because we know that there's so much information in here that you can learn from. It's a really dense storyline pack with all these different things that the kids are learning at, at social, you know, in social enterprise courses at schools like Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, it's in the film or Santa Clara or Washington or UNC, some of the kids in that won the grants that are in the film. So um, I think that we, okay, where, where's like our success was, 
going to be, well, at very least, we're going to make a really great uh, film for, for schools. But I think what we, we found out was, and I think thanks to um, the issue really crystallizing over the last few years while we're making this film, like the issue of environmental crisis and and that, that becoming such a part of our zeitgeist that, that, that we're also, also able to more capture, you know, this bigger conversation. And I think people, um, people really need hope. They need solutions. And so, so I think that, that, um, we have an opportunity here to really tap that. So I think it always remains to be seen, uh, you know, how many eyeballs, but we were able to, through the successful film festival run through, you know, picking up uh, educational distribution with Rocco films, which actually distributes films like, like uh, inconvenient Tr truth and those kind of films to go get into schools across the country. But on the other hand, we were able to pick up global distribution with 1091 pictures, which is in, you know, uh, more than three dozen countries. So, uh, you know, I think we were able to successfully do that. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, it still remains to be seen. Uh, we will find out as, as the distribution rolls out. And I think that, 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 um, Beyond the film itself, too, which I think is beautiful about this concept and the mission at the center of the film, is that we have uh, a take action website and page that will continually be updated because uh, we were just talking about this, Jeremy and I, in our last interview, that that there are things that, that we take from this movie that, that live on. You know, I'm always now, I'm seeing so many new companies that, that are part of our mission. So, so the idea, the story lives on every day and there's probably a bigger movie that's next that, that, that goes bigger on this topic. So I think to Jeremy's point, we are able to be there at the right time to start these conversations and start breaking them open to not only a considerable uh, uh, national audience, but also a larger global audience and then see how it goes and then really try to engage people in this concept and seeing where we can take it. Beautiful. And first of all, congrats on the success that you've had. Thank you. And, and I agree with you 100%. There, I think you're sitting on a really powerful opportunity, and you brought up uh, Inconvenient Truth. Is there anything in the works like Al Gore took that and created a climate reality project? Is there some kind of educational platform that you guys are looking to create beyond the website, which obviously we'll share links and, and whatnot, but is there what's the next level to keep this, this movement moving? Yeah, um, so one of the... Uh, ideas that we came upon in the last year was we were, we wanted to get this to university students, um, business students. And so we decided as COVID was hitting and everything was going virtual as far as classrooms to work with a sustainability professor, uh, Derek Sabori. Um, and he created a lecture that goes with the film and, um, he also provided, you know, a quiz and some assignments. So we basically have packaged it up um, so that we can basically take this to um, college, even high school professors and say, hey, you might not know everything about sustainability. You might know a lot, but here is a package that you can either show the film and talk about it and do your own lecture or use the whole lecture and share it with their students. So. One of our one of our major initiatives is to try and get the film shown in um, high schools and colleges mm -hmm. across the country and even around the world um, to to really like take it to the next level. Very cool. I was you must have been super inspired filming the students that you feature in the movie. I mean, they were not that the adults weren't extremely well spoken, but those kids were just like, whoa, like they get it right. <laughs> they uh, yes, they were. That was my favorite part of the movie. Definitely mm -hmm. was able to interview and talk to those kids. Nice. They are just so on fire and because they're just so solution driven. They're like, we're going to do this. Like, and there's so much hope there, but, and they're, they're brilliant too. They're, they have so much energy. Their ideas are amazing. I mean, you know, like they're the, the, the cookies being made out of uh, all the leftover rice from all these fast food Asian restaurants. Right. Yeah. I mean, this, Things like that, the ideas, you know, bio, the biogas food truck, you know, <laughs> they're just on fire. They're so amazing. So amazing. Yeah. And you bring up a great point that they weren't just like hopeful in like an innocent, naive way. They were brilliant, <laughs> like yeah, super they, smart. So very, yeah, very they're, all, 
they're they're all about the action and i think that's what this movie is all about is taking action and uh i think that was like again you know um um, what we really wanted to get through i think was that real inspirational message of solution hopeful solutions and i think that was something we really wanted to 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 make sure that at the end of the day that was and you, there. And you did. And you did. And that's why I wanted to have you guys here today. That's why I created this podcast, right? I created this because I'm someone that loves the ocean, loves the dolphins and whales, the marine life, and just at the whole deal. And I just see what's going on. And I, I'm part of that whole group of people that's frustrated and didn't know what to do. So I'm like, I'm going to go out and talk to people like you that are totally focused on solutions. And that's why whatever I can do to support getting your movie out there beyond even what we're doing here today is, is so important. So let's go back to collaboration. Um, Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. It's encouraging to see companies. You mentioned them a couple of times like Amazon, Numi, Guayaquil, Bronner's, et cetera. I don't know. Um, that are working together for the greater good. And to me, this requires a major shift from a competitive scarcity mindset to one of abundance especially with brands that are in so-called competing niches, right? It requires a mindset like, hey, even if we sell the same product, there's plenty of buyers out there. We can all do well. So, Jeremy, is this? do you feel that this is just the beginning of a much-needed trend? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when we – it's funny because early days when we started doing a lot of stuff with Guayaquil, um, we had some people in our in our – in our let's call it our realm whether they were consultants or finance people that were like hey are you sure you want to you know <laughs> work so closely with the company that also sells a beverage and you know our mindset was you know what we're we're one percent or less of of the market right now the the big players are 99.9 percent of the market we together we can make a little more noise about organic and fair trade and we if we can do that together by all means let's do it and i think that that's 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 something that you start to think about more when you're when you're in the different business models um and you're saying okay we're we're also a triple bottom line and you're seeing that with the b corps as well where they're like okay we're all b corps you know there might be some b corp companies that do the same thing but they're united by this you know this cohesive, like, hey, we're on the same kind of social and environmental mission to be a better company. And, um, yeah, it's starting to happen. It's starting to happen a lot more than it used to. Totally. Richard, anything you would add to that? Well, I think that, you know, I think that we're seeing so much demand from the consumer. With tra- they want transparency, especially with the, the younger generation. Like, they are going to see through – uh, greenwashing, you know, so they're demanding things, you know, and I think that Jeremy can speak really well to this, but uh, we're looking for that big shift in what the consumer is demanding. And, and I think that, that, that there is signs, um, that, I mean, just going to these, these, these conferences now, these sustainable brand conferences that, that involve all the biggest companies in the world. And, what they're talking about. I mean, they are admitting issues that, that need to be solved that they might not be even admitting in, in the press. So mm-hmm. I think there is a big, I think there's a bigger movement. There's definitely a, a swing um, that's consumer driven. Um, and then especially with the next generation. And I think we're looking for that tipping point, you know, and I think that what, whatever we can do is definitely uh, worth, worth giving it a try to see if we can push, give it that push it needs. But like you said, that the, the stakes are high and we don't have a lot of time. So You're right, and, and you're also right that awareness is growing. And I think what we're seeing is as, as awareness grows, the consumer is becoming more conscious and also more curious about where their products come from, what needed to happen from a carbon footprint, footprint standpoint to get that product into their hands. Uh, some companies are starting to talk about a climate diet. Uh, I recently interviewed Cyril of Parley, and we talked about traceability. So let's talk a little bit more about that. Is there a way to know just by looking at a label or looking at packaging to really find out you know, what we're saying, where this really came from and what, what it took to get there? 
Yeah, I mean that's that's the premise actually of the backbone of organic is is having documenting traceability, fair trade as well. You got to know where things came from. But the cool thing is there's advancements that's been coming, um, technological advancements, so that you can all of a sudden look at a QR code and that'll tell you exactly, for example, where you know that cacao bean that went into your chocolate bar came from you know and and those things are starting to elevate the game of organic and fair trade so that you really can get even more intimate with where the food or the products that you're consuming are coming from so um, i think we're going to continue to see amazing innovation in those areas and um, it's going to help us vote with our dollars better absolutely 100 percent. richard what would you say about that Well, I think that we just need to start demanding. We need to start looking for those products and demanding more information. And we are in the age of information. And so I think that that we, uh, once we start doing our research and start looking into things, um, that that that's when it starts. Things start shifting and start happening. So I think that. Um, you know, I, I, I really like the idea of being able to walk into a store of the barcode and just and scan. If I'm in a, deciding on this product and I can just scan that barcode and I can get the kind of key information that I'm looking for. But, you know, the consumer has that responsibility walking into the store that they actually need to like know what they're even looking for. So I think part of why this there's so much information and why there's like why Derek Sapori, the sustainable business professor wrote a glossary is there's so many terms that you just have to learn first. And that I had to learn as a filmmaker, like what is a triple bottom line business? What is fair trade? What actually is organic? So you have to learn these things. And then before you can even know how to find them. And then, you know, at, at that point, then I'm starting to think, okay, well, I've got this, this organic product and there might be another product that in the mix that I've got to start then thinking about this other piece of the puzzle as well. Um, the packaging piece and is it plastic or not? And so I think that, you know, I am starting to, as someone who's actually, um, uh, definitely a few years behind Jeremy and the people that started this, this, this company is Amazon and some of the other companies that I actually, um, I'm starting to learn things and through the process of making this film. And then at that point I can, I can start demanding more, but like, um, the idea that now there's a biodegradable package, thanks to new me spearheading work with the one step closer coalition and brands like Samazon working together to start having the buying power to actually put together a biodegradable packaging option. So once those things are available, now I, as a consumer can go, man, like, okay, I want my organic fair trade product, but I also then want it in a biodegradable package. So um, now that's a, even an option. So I think as these things become more available to me, then I can become a more uh, active consumer and even what with my dollar even more effectively. Definitely. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. In the film, you feature Laura Dickinson, right, of the yeah. nonprofit One Step Closer. I think in the movie, you call her the connective tissue to solve a lot of these big problems like plastic packaging. Um, yeah, tell us more about the great work that they're doing and how they're inspiring businesses to really take on this regenerative model. Well, Jeremy, do you want to start with that? Uh, do you want to start with OSC? Or I could start talk and talk a little bit about really the discovery of uh, One Step Closer as, in a way, the, the connective tissue, like you said, Rich, that really is what connects some of these core brands in the film. And really, it's just it's a nonprofit, and Laura's heading it up uh, with this idea that as a collective, they they can find these solutions together that can take us one step closer to a sustainable future. So as a filmmaker and a storyteller, she was like the pot of gold in a way, because there is, uh, you know, there is that true story that really uh, she is there as the, you know, as the the facilitator in a way, but Jeremy, you can speak a little bit more about there and cause he's had that relationship with Samazon one step closer. Yeah. I mean, the beauty of, you know, I don't, I'm thinking it was 10 years ago or so sitting around with some of the people from Numi and Guayaquil and we're all kind of 
lamenting around like we want to solve these bigger issues, but we also we got to make sure our businesses survive, you know. So this idea was born out of companies that wanted to try and figure out a way to solve a problem and knew that as a collective we were having a hard time because we would go to the the supplier of our plastic bowls and say, hey, we want recycled, we want biodegradable, we want better sustainability. And then over here, the other companies are doing the same thing. So we we knew this was happening. So we, we all kind of devised this idea of like, why don't we, you know, base, basically help start an NGO that will basically do this for us. And then we'll actually go out and lobby with all the other companies in the natural products industry and get our buying power up, you know, instead of being like these one or two companies trying to do it on our own. And that's kind of what happened with One Step Closer. It was it was formed and founded. And now it's like we can all just become members of that and let them drive policy. Um, we can, you know, share in it by contributing resources and being on boards and being in committees. And they can go do what they do. And we can all continue to try and you know, keep our businesses afloat, which is, you know, as, as it is a challenge in itself, um, without trying to like, go and take on policy at the same time. Well, that's kind of what I just was going to say. It's, it's so inspiring. The thought of you and your brother and all the leaders of your company sitting in a room somewhere talking about this <laughs> versus you, you imagine most companies are sitting around saying, how can we sell more of our shit? How can exactly. we sell more, sell more, make more? And I guess my question is, and obviously there's marketing conversations that you guys have, have draw the correlation between the more time you're focused on doing the right thing, how, how is that impacting the bottom line? You know, maybe you're spending less time talking on marketing, but does that become your marketing because you're putting out this better product and people get that? You know what I mean? Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting one because I've seen us as a company over the last ten years drift into more sustainability marketing, and actually, I personally don't. I'm not a big fan of it. You know, I think it's important that we share the story of what we're doing, but you know, I think it's it's important that the sustainability is part of our DNA, and that the consumer is smart enough to like figure that out, and we'll figure that out because they see the transparency. As long as we're transparent, they can see that and they'll appreciate that. I've always uh, honestly been against like selling the good deeds that a company does um, and, and more in building it in our DNA and letting the consumer see that. Because in the end of the day, we have to help you understand that eating acai is really healthy and yeah. delicious. And if we're spending all our time talking about our sustainability, Honestly, that just gets a little, you know, greenwashy to me. And that's what a lot of the big companies shifted to in, you know, between 2000 and 2015 when greenwashing got real popular because it was like, hey, we've done our surveys. People want this. People want more sustainable. So they all started saying, oh, now made with, you know, 1% recycled plastic or something. Yeah. And people could, you know, maybe feel a little better about that. But like the reality is, you know, you got to sell your product. Your product has to be awesome, but you need to have that like built into your DNA that, you know, those values. And that's, that's what we tried to highlight in this film was companies that were like that. And what we're trying to encourage people to do is to basically seek out companies like that, not companies that are trying to like sell their product based on a, a gimmick that might be good for the environment, you know? That's excellent. So build it into the DNA and not need to like preach it <laughs> as your front message. It's like the, the quote unquote spiritual person always who brags about how much they meditate every day. <laughs> it's like, yeah, like be that it, person, right? Go an ahead. interesting point was brought up by our professor. Um, you know, his, one of his specialties was biodiversity, the Amazon rainforest and what he calls, you know, uh, working for us. And I think that's a really good example of what Jeremy is saying, that what you find is, is that if you sustainably manage those trees, that the, the forest is going to become more biodiverse. The fruits are going to become better. Um, the forest like itself is going to become healthier. And that if you, if you focus on that, um, there is a benefit to 
the local ecosystem and the global ecosystem to the plants and animals of that forest and also we as humans of the planet. So I think that that's an incredible thing that, that, that they've tapped here that, that by, you know, they actually support the farmers with education on how to trim their trees and by managing these trees properly, they become more biodiverse, biodiverse these forests and the fruits become, uh, more nutritious healthier and so so from there everything works out and i think that that is if we all start working in a way like the forest is working and i think that's something that guayaki speaks to really well is that they are thinking about their their work in that forest and how it all emanates from there right i, I would think if someone's listening to this conversation and they haven't seen the film yet it sounds like it's a nine hour, you know, <laughs> nine part series, docu-series or something. But it's amazing that you got all this into, a, how long is it? Like 55 minutes long, right? Yeah, it's, not 51. Even, it's not even an hour we've long. Got, we've got enough for a docu-series, that's for sure. Just a lot of good a lot stuff of, on the editing floor, unfortunately. A lot of B-roll <laughs> laying around. <laughs> I mean, you got a lot. You, uh, it must have been a hell of an editing job. So speaking of the film, uh, yeah. a question for both of you. We'll go Jeremy first. I want to know, really, what did you learn from making this film, both professionally and maybe even more importantly, just as a human being? You know, um, one of the key takeaways for me was patience. <laughs> patience? What um, is that? I want patience you know, and I we, want it now. <laughs> there was a lot of hurry up and like, let's get this out and we need to do this. And, and honestly, I at the end... It, it really, I, my instincts were wait, wait, wait. And it really feels like, and then COVID hit and we actually had time to refine it a little more and make it a little bit better. But it was just this, this great payoff of like, trust your instincts, have patience, stick with the message. Um, and you know, don't, don't just get it out there make sure that the product that you get out there is, is the product that you really believe in. And then you'll have so much more energy and, you know, desire to like put the energy to getting it out there. And so, you know, I, I, I think that was my biggest learning. <laughs> is that as a, um, someone that was part of a film or also does that spill over just into life in general? <laughs> it, it spills over into it all, but you know, we, we had a lot of things happen during this film. Even like I lost my house in a fire during this, you know, in the, in the Malibu fire. So it was like, there was a lot that happened during this film. Um, and, uh, yeah, I can't even go into the details how much I learned. <laughs> Let, let's, we'll come back to the fire in a moment. I, I want to get Richard's answer first. Um, you, you kind of smirked when he mentioned the word patience, Richard, <laughs> as a filmmaker. <laughs> so, well, there's so many levels to patience that like idea of being patient uh, in the edit patient with regards to the release and patient with regards to waiting through a pandemic. So there's a lot of levels of patience. You're, you're, trying, you're trying not to become a patient, right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I know. We'll go get our, uh, our, get our uh, physicals after this process. But um, no, on all honesty though, I think the biggest takeaway for us is that we are a global community that this is a global story that solutions need to be across borders um, that the climate crisis is not just localized, you know, that that these issues we're talking about, whether it's solving a, a global pandemic or a global environmental crisis, is, these are not nationalistic conversations. Um, we've seen politics, kind of this divide and conquer strategy with regards to trying to polarize communities. And I think that what we've been able to tap with this film, which is really exciting, because I think that's where, you know, on kind of a general level, like where the breakthroughs are going to be come for the, come for the environment, for our health, for the social issues globally, is like we we become a global community and a collective. So I think that the real learning here was that there is a true collective at work. There is a bigger movement at hand and that it's really hopeful and inspiring. And, and how do I take that away and put it into my work? Uh, it gives me reason and purpose and belief that we can 
that we can tell stories like this, that we can actually connect them. I think one of the biggest questions coming into this, can we cover so much ground and, and make it connect and make it work as a story, you know? And, and I think that, the, you know, how this, how, how kind of where we go with the film uh, will really ultimately determine. But at the end of the day, I think that the belief that, Hey, there is a bigger movement. There is a mission here. Um, it's exciting. It's filled with all these opportunities of collective healing. Uh, it's a real thing. So that we can really, in a way, bank on that. I agree. And like, and like I said, what I loved about it was it, it did offer not just hope, but real actionable solutions. And that's why I asked you, like, how do we keep this conversation going? What is the platform? You mentioned, you know, education, bringing this into schools, which is probably the most important thing. So um, I'm glad that that is happening. Jeremy, let's uh, let's go there. You you met it's come up a couple of times how you lost your home uh, in the Woosley fire in Malibu, California. And for me, there's a, a little personal connection because I got to visit you in your home. I got to meet your beautiful wife. And um, that property was just a true sanctuary for you and your wife and now your two little children. And um, it's probably fair to say that the, the impacts of climate change literally hit home for you in that case. So tell us what you want to share about that and, and what you discovered in the process. And I was glad that you share with me that you're, you're uh, almost redone rebuilding. So you can share a little bit about that too, but really I want to know what you discovered in that whole process. Yeah. I mean, discovered a lot that um we can be cleansed of more or less all of our earthly possessions and we're going to be okay uh, you know in the end you know a lot of the things that you might hold on to you're, you're probably going to let go of one day you will let go of one day so you know for us it was it was just a you know we got knocked down and we got to get back up again um, it's been a lot of work getting through the whole process of trying to rebuild. It's been super intense. Um, you know, the run on rentals, a run on builders, a run on, you know, costs of building, um, a lot of wild things that, you know, it's probably too much information, but that's what people are dealing with when there's like big wildfires or big disasters. It's not just like this, oh, you know okay, your house burned down, now you got to build a new one. It's like, no, like a whole community lost their home. And now like, it's going to take that whole community five, 10 years to get back on their feet. And a lot of, a lot of money, a lot of energy, a lot of everything. And that's, that's happening all over the world, you know, and it's going to continue to happen as climate change continues to drive more hurricanes, more floods, more fires. So I don't know. I think a, a bigger empathy for what others are going through. I mean, luckily for me, I had insurance, you know, I had, you know, a wherewithal to be able to weather the storm and not, you know, have to basically go live out of our, you know, small hotels or apartments or something. We actually were able to find a house for uh, us and our dogs. And again, like a lot of people, I remember right when we lost our house, there was, there was a fire up in NorCal and there were people that were basically camped out in a Walmart parking lot, you know, and it was like, it was a heartbreaking thing to think like, okay, we're okay. We just had a big thing happen, but we're not like camped out in a parking lot, you know? So, um, empathy towards people that are suffering that don't have the resources or, you know, infrastructure to get back up on their feet as easily as, as a lot of us do. I think yeah. that's a really good point too, is Mark Walker also the the day we interviewed him, he had been evacuated from his house in Brentwood for that fire. So it's incredible to think about these fires, for example, in Northern California that Jeremy mentioned, I watch an award-winning as a judge for the Emmy Award documentary category. I, I watched the film on, on the, one of those fires up there, and you really have to look at it not just like this is – these aren't just fires anymore. These are, these are you know, it's basically uh, these 
these forests are like gasoline now based on climate conditions. Like these aren't regular forest fires. And so the, because they are so combustible, they're a lot more dangerous. So I think to Jeremy's point, we need to be really concerned about the people that, that live in these places. Like I live on this canyon. I've been evacuated too. Um, it's scary. It's really scary to be evacuated. I can't imagine how, losing my house. So I think we do all need to be empathetic and, and we need to consider all these things because they all should motivate us to take action. Absolutely. Unfortunately, Jeremy, I can, I can relate all too well. I'm in Laguna Beach, California now, as you know, but before here I lived in Key West, Florida. And the main reason I left there was because I got hit by a hurricane the end of 2005 that destroyed my house and all of my worldly possessions. So I, I had the same moment you had where there was just no material stuff. In fact, I moved to California with two duffel bags, one in each hand, everything I owned in the world. And you quickly realize that stuff is just stuff and it can be replaced. But talk about empathy. Yeah, you think about all the people in the world, if that happened to they, you know, you, you and I are blessed, right? We could rent a hotel room. We could move into a house. We could go stay somewhere. That's not the case for millions and millions of people around the world. If that happened, they're going to be out on the street. So, And as we're saying, if things don't change, these things are going to continue to happen, and on, unfortunately, a greater scale, right? Mm -hmm. Definitely. So thank you for sharing that. I know it's probably not a story you like to revisit too often, but to me, it, it was pertinent, not just on a personal level, but to Richard's point, it wasn't just an accident that that fire happened. In fact, tell me if I'm wrong, but like, it's not common prior that a fire in your area would even occur. Am I right? You know, I mean, Malibu would get a fire every 20 years or so, but um, a combination of the, the conditions and poor upkeep of the, uh, the utility infrastructure, actually the Woolsey fires been found blame already. Southern California Edison admitted blame. A lot of the fires up in NorCal are being blamed on uh, P and G and E for not taking care of their equipment. So those are just unfortunately um, bad business, not taking care of the infrastructure and not something that you can just blame nature on actually. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know. In, in other countries, you wouldn't have the same kind of, I guess, investigative things going on either, you know, where, you know, things like this can happen and they're not necessarily going to figure out that the power company did it. You know, people are just going to take the end of it. Yeah, I hear you. So a few more questions here. So in a perfect world, everything would be organic, yeah. right? The food we eat, the clothes we wear, everything would be regenerative by design. Everything would be based on triple bottom line. Mm -hmm. All decisions would be based on what's best for the planet, for the people, and the companies would still be profitable. This perfect blend of social entrepreneurship, social res uh, responsibility, and fair trade. That's the ultimate win-win-win, right? But we don't live in a perfect world, as we're saying, and everything comes with a cost, including living a sustainable life. So how realistic is this vision of yours on a grand scale? Or better said, since this has been a very hopeful conversation, what has to happen to see this actually come to reality? Yeah, I mean, I think people need to learn how to vote with their dollars and have the values. Um, if we can, if we can take those values, and a lot of it is education. If you start to understand that, you know, my impact. If if buying that, let's let's break it down real simple. There's an organic banana and there's a non-organic banana. You know, if the banana that's non-organic is cheaper, you might say, oh, I want that. It's cheaper. But you don't realize that that banana had pesticides sprayed all over it that ended up in a river that got a bunch of kids sick, that destroyed an area, you know, that didn't pay the people that harvested it. Then you start to think, wait a minute, that that cheaper banana is not really cheaper. You know, it's actually like more expensive if you think of all the costs of that cheaper banana. You know, so I think it's just this education of starting to realize that, you know, it's these these hidden costs are not part of the true cost. And as a consumer, we need to start to realize we want to pay the true cost for things. This is personal responsibility. Companies need to have their corporate responsibility and not think, hey, yeah, we could edge out an extra one percent of profit if we just, you know, 
dumped our pollution in the river. You know, I mean, you could get away with that in the 70s or you yeah. can get away with that right now in some parts of the world, unfortunately. But like that shouldn't be the case. You know, we need to elevate the consciousness of companies and and of people. And that's kind of what the film is about is introducing this idea of conscious commerce, you know, and if we can elevate the consciousness of what we're buying and how we're operating as a company, even think about where you work, you know, is the company that you work for doing conscious commerce? If not, maybe you could go work for a company that does that. There's a bunch of people, companies out there that do that. Is it, are your investments conscious? You know, are you thinking about, oh, I made a bigger percentage this year than that other fund, but do you realize how that percentage was made? Maybe by, you know, raping, raping, pillaging, maybe by building bombs that went to other countries. I don't know. So, you know, that's that's what it comes down to. It's about us being conscious about um, the dollars we spend and, and the activities that we have. I love that you say that because I've been saying for years that the solution to the challenges that the world faces lie in an elevation of consciousness and even when I have always said that, it feels so esoteric. So just the way that you just said that in the last minute, it make, it makes it very practical. So thank you for that. Um, it, make, it, it kind of validates what I've been thinking for a long time, but didn't know how it would actually come to be in reality, if that makes sense. Richard, how would you answer the same question? Well, I think there's a big concern that, that – consumers do not understand that they are actually every day part of this problem. So I think that, that, for example, would you consciously run a red light, especially if people are crossing the street? I mean, luckily the other day I, I, I held a beat at the, at the crosswalk um, because someone came barreling through that red. I had like a gut feeling. It was the weirdest thing. Um, maybe because I just told my son to be safe on the road. What I'm getting at is that what we were talking about before is that thinking of the problem as this existential thing that isn't upon us, but like every day we're contributing to putting plastic in the ocean. Every piece of plastic that we're using that's only used once is it's like you're literally just putting it right in the ocean. So you're literally barreling in your car, in my mind, through that red light, through that crosswalk. And I think that there's a big gap. And so we need to really, to your point, we need to elevate our consciousness. How do we get people to understand like their actions are contributing to some serious issues? And that until we start realizing that, that we're going to continue to create more problem than solution. So, so I think that the... You know, that that's the big challenge and it continues to be. It's like, um, you know, uh, Paul Hawkins said it, that it, it's a future. He, he called it a future existential threat. And like our threat is right here. It's right upon us now. So the big disconnect. And that's, I think, you know, one of the one of the bigger concerns moving forward. Like, OK, we have to be educated to actually demand uh, demand things from our different can, brands that we're buying from so we have to be educated so um you know i think that that part of the process is you know thrive market for example a big part of what they do at thrive is educate the consumer so there is that big piece of we need to educate and continue to educate and get out there and you know demand for that transparency and and you know i don't know how we're gonna gonna do that um but we're gonna continue to kind of showcase showcase the opportunities and the solutions while at the same time you know we can't ignore uh the problems too like you know we have to continue to educate people on the issues and what are the problems we're trying to solve too so education awareness um which will lead to an elevation of consciousness which will lead to people making the right decisions mm -hmm. um this is going to be a big part of it guys this has been an, an enlightening conversation. Um, Jeremy, I, I applaud you and Ryan and, and everybody that's part of Samazon and the work that you guys have been doing for 20 years. It'll be fun to see what happens over the next 20 years. Uh, Richard, I applaud you for making this incredible movie. We'll, we'll share links for people so they can access the movie and a lot of the different things we've been talking about today. You guys are awesome. Um, 
I just I can't thank you enough for taking the time to share your message. And uh, last question for both of you: What's the best way that people can both support the movie? And as we're saying, it's it's not just about this movie. It's there's a much bigger cause here. How how can people support both the movie and the bigger cause, Richard? Well, they just have to go to seedingchangefilm.com and sign up uh, to to watch the movie, or they can also even visit their their uh, favorite portal like iTunes or Amazon. Um, and the film is going to be available on all major platforms if it isn't already by the time that this podcast gets out. Um, so to watch the film, they can check in and keep posted on seedingchangefilm.com. Uh, but again, they can also look at Amazon, iTunes, and those kind of platforms as well, because we will be available, if not available right now, on all the major platforms. And then with regards to this whole idea of the mission beyond the film and voting with your dollar, it can start the minute that they go in, that the person listening to this goes into the store and they can start, they can start by looking at what they're going to purchase and making sure that 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 purchase is they're putting their money behind a company that that is actually doing good and being part of the solution rather than a company that that might say that they're one percent for the planet but are actually contributing to the problem so i think that there's two things you know watch the movie and learn more uh and then on the other hand like really you can start taking action as soon as today when the next purchase you make vote with your dollar jeremy final thought yeah, we would love it if you would watch the film and uh, share it with your friends and family. And um, our, our website, seedingchangefilm.com, will have um, a take action page that will help you learn how to vote with your dollar, provide links to articles, different apps. There's, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's starting to pop up as people are starting to want to learn how to vote with their dollar, which is really exciting. So be a part of the solution. Beautiful. Jeremy, let's get together soon. Richard, we have no excuse not together. Uh, soon, you're about five minutes from me. Let's go take a walk on the beach. Jeremy, I can't wait to see your, your property as it's uh, redone. I'm sure it's going to be even more magical than before. That is our show for today. Go watch the movie Seeing Changes. Awesome. You guys are awesome. Keep doing the work. Uh, keep sharing the love. And we'll see you next time, everybody. That's our show. Thanks. <laughs>